This presentation goes over the beginning of the Living Constitution. This is uh, just the basic overview of the outline of the Constitution. In front of you, you will see the legislative, executive, and judicial branches representing Congress, which is bicameral, House and Senate, the President and the Vice President, and the bureaucracy under it representing the executive, and the judicial branch representing the Supreme Court. So we are going to um, just really go over a brief overview of how the Constitution is lined out. Really, if you look at the Constitution, it is a very skeletal framework. There are only about 7,000 words, uh, and it's about three parchment papers um, of uh, writing. It's not very long at all. Contrast that with some bills like our health care uh, recent bill, and it's over 10,000 pages long. You can see that really to have a framework for government. It's very basic and skeletal. It has three major parts. We've gone over these in class, but the preamble is the introductory statement. Uh, you might remember the six goals of government, and it emphasizes that we, the people, are in charge. The next part I want to spend a little bit of time on. These are your Constitution test questions. These are very basic questions about the Constitution, but they are definitely things that you need to simply memorize. So um, I sometimes look at articles like chapters in a book, and so this is how the Constitution is lined out. Articles 1, 2, and 3 simply go over the national portion of how the government is going to run. It goes over and describes the three branches of government, how they will be carried out, and what powers each will possess. Article 1, legislature, it's how laws are made, so always know anything you want to find out about Congress, which is the House and the Senate, you go to Article 1, the legislature. Article 2 is the executive branch. They enforce and carry out the laws. Anything you want to find out about the president is mentioned in this article. And lastly, Article 3 is the judicial branch. It interprets the law. It is the shortest of the three articles, and it created the Supreme Court. That is the only court created in the U.S. Constitution. So the first three articles deal with the federal government, but if you look at Article 4, it deals with states, that concept of federalism where we have a national government and state governments. Remember under the Articles of Confederation, how um, states were the main power. Well, they wanted to reiterate how states should get along, so they created Article 4 and set some guidelines. There are two very powerful clauses in Article 4. The full faith and credit clause means each state must um, respect and obey every other state's laws when they are in that state. So full faith and credit. The second clause is called the Privileges and Immunities Clause, meaning that if you are a member of a state, you can grant privileges as long as they don't discriminate against other citizens from other states, um, but you can grant privileges. An example of that would be in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition. Since residents pay state taxes as well as federal, you can give them a break on in-state tuition. That's an example of Article 4. Article 5, we went over this one in detail as well, but it simply outlines how to change the Constitution. If you change the written word by adding or deleting, it is called an amendment. This goes toward a Constitution, and the formal amendment process, remember, says how to propose and how to ratify. There are four ways total outlined. Article 6, this is a very short one. All it says is, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. No treaty, no state document. Um, there shouldn't be anything that exists that conflicts with the Constitution. If so, it will be found null and void and called unconstitutional and stricken from the record. So Article 6, Supremacy Clause. Article 7 basically said nine of the 13 existing states need to ratify the Constitution before it can go into effect. The first state uh, to ratify the Constitution was Delaware, the ninth state was New Hampshire, and then slowly after that each state um, that hadn't adopted it, Rhode Island being the last of the 13 um, states to do so. So we have the preamble, we have the articles, you need to know the topic of each of those. The last portion are simply the amendments. Now when we talk about 
um, Articles 1 through 7, that is known as the original Constitution. Any additions or changes are called amendments, and these are at the end of the document. Well, we know from discussing um, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist that the Anti-Federalists wanted certain protections in writing. And so James Madison is going to take um, that under his wing, and those first 10 will originally be called the Bill of Rights. But over time, in our 227 years, there have only been 27 formal changes. It is very difficult. The Founding Fathers wanted to make sure that there was broad consensus not only at the national government level, but at the state government level before we added or changed to the Constitution. These changes, again, are called amendments. James Madison is going to um, write the original ones. So he gathered, he asked the state legislatures to submit um, possibilities for amendments that they want would want protected. Out of those 200, he sorted them, and he chose 16 to present officially to Congress. Out of those 16, Congress voted to send 12 to the state legislatures. Remember, Congress proposes state uh, legislatures or special conventions ratify. So Congress chose 12 to send to the states, and the states rejected two more of those topics. And if you look at the past classes that we had last week, you can see um, examples of those amendments that are still sitting in the state legislature that have not been ratified through the years. So Congress sends 12, and out of those 12 that they sent, the state legislatures only chose 10, and those first 10 become our Bill of Rights. They're amendments 1 through 10, and we're briefly going to describe those. This date right here, December 15th, 1791, is known as the Bill of Rights birthday. It was two years after the Constitution went into effect. So again, 1787, we wrote the document. By 1789, March 4, 1789, the Constitution went into effect. And then two years later, December 15th, the Bill of Rights officially um, goes into um, effect as well. Now, this concept right here is very important. Uh, it is known as protection of rights of the individuals against the national government. Originally, the Bill of Rights was only written to protect us against the national government. This idea, over time, is called selective incorporation, and it's also called, called nationalizing the Bill of Rights. And what I mean by saying that is, over time, the Bill of Rights has come um, to protect us against state governments as well through the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. And we'll discuss this in greater detail, um, but I do want you to know that originally the Bill of Rights only protected us against the national government. If you look at the Missouri Constitution, we had a Bill of Rights. It was Article 1. It's the very first thing we put in there. But over time, portions of the First Amendment, of the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Eighth, um, have been incorporated to um, protect us against state as well as national government. So I just wanted to point that out, that that's one of the ideas we talk about later. So let's quickly go over the Bill of Rights. Um, Article 1, if you remember um, the acronym SPAR, Speech, Press, Petition, Assembly, and Religion, um, those are things Congress cannot take away from us. They have been protected. If you, um, We'll break these down um, in more detail, but we do have things such as symbolic speech, under religion, there are two clauses, the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause, um, which is how religion is viewed when um, it goes before the Supreme Court. Amendment 2 is the right to bear arms. You have two arms. That's an easy one to remember. It mostly pertained as citizens took up arms for protection. Um, it is very rarely does this go before the Supreme Court. They pretty much let states decide um, the right to bear arms. Number three, no quartering of troops. You cannot house troops in private homes uh, during peacetime. And this was one of the things that was definitely at the forefront of their mind because that had happened dur during the Revolutionary War. Number four, no illegal search and seizure. Um, the national government cannot illegally 
uh, come into your home without a search warrant and look for whatever they want. This has been clarified through certain Supreme Court cases, such as Matt versus Ohio, through the years. Um, we do look at certain things um, in greater detail, such as the exclusionary rule, et cetera. But fourth really um, is a huge one. Um, for example, is that expanded to include your phone? Isn't it phone an extension of like a personal office since you have documents and things like that? So they've really had to clarify it um, recently at the um, federal court level. Number five, when we look at five, six, seven, and eight, they all deal with criminal proceedings, and it's a progression of criminal rights. So look at the first one. It says criminal proceedings. This one, um, this concept of due process, I want you to star that one. I can't emphasize enough. The due process clause applies against the national government, and it is a protection that the government must treat us fairly. And as we start to talk about this in more detail, there's two types of due process. You can have procedural, which is how the government um, treats us, how they um, search a car, how they search your home, the procedure in which they do so. Substantive means, is the law valid? Um, sometimes the police will carry everything out fairly, but the law they're following is poor, so the law could be violating substan substantive due process. Double jeopardy, can you be tried twice for the same crime? The answer is no. Self-incrimination, you might have heard on TV shows pleading the Fifth Amendment, that means you do not have to testify against yourself. You have the right to remain silent is a very famous phrase from the Miranda rights. Imminent domain, this is the concept of uh, taking private property for government use. The government cannot do that unless they provide fair market value to you. Um, when there is an extension um, of roads, of building airports, of things like that, sometimes you need to purchase um, land from people in order to do that to make way for the greater good. And so the government can give you fair market value for your home or a portion of it. All right, so fifth deals with criminal proceedings. Six extends that. You have the right to a speedy and public trial. You have a right to a jury of your peers called an impartial jury. You have the right to be informed of charges against you. Remember, the government cannot suspend a writ of habeas corpus. A writ is a court order. Habeas corpus is having the body, so they have to tell you why a person is being held or they get to go free. Another portion, you have the right to an attorney, which is assistance of counsel. So all these go in the six. So once a person um, has been charged, they have the right to remain silent, but now they have a right to these things that were often denied to them in the past under different forms of government. Seven simply talks about civil trials. Civil is different from criminal, and the fact that civil is between two people who cannot come to an agreement on their own, and they need an arbiter or a judge to interpret the law for them. So civil trials at the federal level are described in number seven. The last one, how I talked about five, six, seven, and eight being chunks dealing with criminal. Um, eighth is punishment, and it basically says you can have no excessive bail or fine. So if it's murder, of course, it's going to be a higher bail posted or fine compared to a simple misdemeanor. The punishment must fit the crime, and there can be no cruel or unusual punishment. There are different forms of uh, death penalty. Any death penalty case runs through the Eighth Amendment, uh, meaning is the electric chair valid? Is lethal injection, val lethal injection valid? Can you have a firing squad? Uh, there are all sorts of things that take place under no, no cruel or unusual punishment. The ninth, unenumerated rights. James Madison added this one in at the suggestion of the state's meaning. There are rights that they knew that would come up that they had not written down, and these can fall under the Ninth Amendment. One of those rights is known as the right to privacy, and the right to privacy um, is often, it was seen in the court case Griswold versus Connecticut, where um, people are promised a certain degree of privacy. And the Supreme Court has ruled that under unenumerated, that there are rights not numbered yet, and we can interpret that under the Ninth Amendment. And the Supreme Court has upheld that. Also, the concept of um, pro-life, pro-choice, and abortion rights are often taken under the right of privacy due to a woman's right um, to protect her body. The tenth I've mentioned 
um, before in class several times, but 10 is any power not given to the federal government is reserved to state governments. This is known as a reserved power. Anytime you see reserved, think of states. What can states do? What do they have the power to do? And the 10th Amendment clearly states that if the power is not given to the federal government, it is reserved to the states. This is a simple list and the time required for ratification. You can see the Bill of Rights was um, many years ago and it took two years to ratify. One of the shortest, if you look at the bottom, is three months it took to ratify because the Vietnam War was going on and they lowered that voting age to 18 since men could go fight at 18. One of the longest is an original one proposed by James Madison dealing with the 27th Amendment, which deals with congressional pay raises, meaning there has to be an intervening election before a pay raise can go into effect. And that was very controversial in 1992 when Congress banned honorariums and gave themselves a $50,000 pay increase and quickly the voters said that's not okay we want an election in between when you vote or yourself a pay increase and when that pay increase actually takes place the last thing remember formal amendment process this is how uh, the constitution is amended you need to understand all those steps we went over this in great detail in class but it's proposed at two-thirds always a larger percent to be ratified. National government proposes, states ratify. This is the most common way to have a proposal by two-thirds of both houses of Congress and ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures, which is 38 states. Uh, a national convention has never been needed, but if so called for by two-thirds of the state legislatures, Congress would hold one, and the fourth way, it can be ratified by state conventions. This has only been used once to repeal the 18th Amendment, um, and that became the 21st Amendment. So I hope this makes sense. That's an easier way. You can look at the Equal Rights Amendment, too, to see what that is and why seven years is the typical time, um, but this is just another way of looking at it. So those um, are the first 10 amendments in detail, a little bit about the Bill of Rights, and also the skeletal framework of the Constitution.